Welcome to Veggie Happenings. This is our, our fun tomato veggie happenings. We're really excited that uh, to talk about tomatoes today and of course the, the, the pests in the garden as well. And we have our master food preservers that are coming along and they're going to do a demo for you today on cool season pestos. So we'll wait just a few minutes and let everybody come in. Um, if we can go back to that first slide, that would be great, Nancy. So I want you to notice these are my tomatoes from last year, and I'm going to be talking to you today about planning your, um, your tomato, your, the tomatoes you're going to grow in your garden. So last year, uh, I had problem uh, with restraint, as you can see. I love to have lots of different colors of tomatoes. So I want you to notice the variations in size and color um, and types of tomatoes. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that as we move along. Okay. So I just wanted to remind you that your audio and video will be off for this webinar. Um, please use the Q&A box for your questions and not the chat. Um, we are recording this and I, and I did want to let you know this is April 2022. So if you're watching this way off in the future, just know that this is our best science-based information that we have right now. You always want to check to make sure uh, to see the date on whatever you're watching uh, on YouTube. Okay, next slide. Um, so there's lots of resources. You can go to our Master Gardener website and I'll give you the QR code. So if you have your, your phone available, I'm doing that at the end. So, um, and I want you to notice one of the things Kitty's gonna be talking about is tomato supports. So here is a green giant tomato that is getting started in my Texas tomato cage and she'll be talking about that in a minute. So we are still in a drought. And so we have lots of information on food gardening with less water in our drop down menu. In fact, we even have um, an article on growing tomatoes with less water. Next slide, please. So we are uh, master gardeners and we're going to, we always go through and garden sustainably. We plant the right plant in the right place at the right time. Aren't you glad you haven't planted your tomatoes with the weather like it is right now? You, if you already have them in, you're gonna have to do a lot of babysitting and protecting them a little bit because it's pretty cold and windy. We, most importantly, we nurture and protect the soil. We mulch to save water and to prevent weeds. Uh, we don't use synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, or pesticides. We get what we need out of the soil because we give things back to the soil. We practice minimal soil disturbance because lots of the great stuff in your soil that's helping everything grow is alive. And you want to make sure that you are not digging it all up and tearing apart its home. We use flowers that benefit plants and beneficial insects. And we use compost and organic amendments. Next slide. So the first off, we're gonna, going to talk about those nasty cabbage white butterflies. And so up first is Jude Sharp. Jude, take it away. Okay, here we go. Um, the cabbage white butterfly and its um, component, the imported cabbage worm. Um, next slide, please. The, you've, you've probably already seen these, um, these, these, these butterflies fluttering about. The male is white, the female is buff colored, and they have one to four black spots on their wings. Uh, the eggs are oblong, football shaped, and laid singly on the underside of the leaves of brassicas. So they're fairly, they're fairly easy to see, but you have to really look for them. Next slide. The larval form is the imported cabbage worm, and this is the form that creates and, and causes the, the most damage. Uh, they're green and hairy, they move slowly, 
and they're sluggish, but they feed voraciously. Um, next slide. The adults are active during daylight hours. They're very active and they're very elusive. Um, they're active all year in California and the butterflies emerge as earlier as because the climate's on, the, the climate is warming. Um, next slide, please. The pest overwinters in the pupil stage on the host plants. Take a look at this, um, take a look at this photograph because this is the pupil stage um, and it is a fairly unusual shape. So if you look for this shape and uh, and and, uh, and 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 pest during the um, during the during the late fall and early winter, it should be easy easy to dislodge and destroy so that you minimize the number of adult um, um, moths that you have to deal with. When you see something that looks like this on your uh, on your brassica um, leaves or brassica plants, you really want to um, get, get rid of it. Okay, next slide, please. The worms prefer broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, and kale, but they will eat all brassicas. Um, within a week of seeing butterflies, look for signs of worms. The worms chew irregular holes in leaves and they can just destroy your plants with no thought whatsoever. Um, they bore into the heads of cabbage and they drop greenish brown fecal pellets. And that, um, and then the fecal pellets get into the, um, the broccoli and the cabbage and cauliflower and make it essentially inedible. Um, next slide, please. This is an example of the kind of serious damage that, um, that, the, that the worm can cause, even in low numbers. They can defoliate an entire plant. They prefer leafy foliage, but they will eat anything. And they're difficult to dislodge, uh, and, they're, and they can be overlooked when cleaning the produce. Look at the uh, photograph in the, uh, in, in, on the bottom right. You can see how difficult it is to see these worms. Next slide. Early season management is critical. Look for and destroy the worms and the eggs on the undersides of leaves. If you see butterflies fluttering around, check for eggs and keep checking. Next slide. You can try growing brassicas early in the season in, uh, in, 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 while it's still cool so that the crop can mature before the weather warms. If you're growing cabbage, you can plant resistant varieties. Use row covers to prevent egg laying by butterflies and don't allow worm populations, especially to build up on seedlings. Next slide. You can apply BTK or spinosad um, early in the larval stages, but they, it has to be reapplied every seven days. That may sound like a big hassle, but it's worth it to protect your, um, your, your edible plants. Both BTK and spinosad are organically acceptable. Follow, follow the directions for applying. And if you find that you have um, that you have plants that are infected with worms, soak, soak them in cold salt water and that will remove the larva. Um, next slide. Cabbage white butterflies and their larva make growing late season brassicas a challenge. Start your crops in the fall, cover seedlings with row covers, watch carefully as the plants start to head and apply BTK or spinosad at the first sign of trouble. And there you have it. Okay. Great, thank you, Jude. I know that I, I got my, my brassicas in a little bit late and it, it, it's been a challenge. Aphids also are uh, 
a, a challenge with when you put them in a little bit late and depending on our weather. So we're going with the flow. So I'm going to talk to you about how to plant your tomato garden. And I just want to let you know that we have an excellent um, talk on tomatoes that we did on Veggie Happenings last April. And so you can, uh, I rewatched that. Um, it's one of my favorites. Um, and it's on YouTube and it's April, 2021. So, and it was done by my mentor, uh, Elaine Walter, who's taught me most of what I know. So, okay, so I'm, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so tomatoes. Now, <clears throat> this is my friend Denise DeRose's um, tomatoes. And we're always so happy with all of our tomatoes. Look at how many she's got. Um, at the er beginning of the season, I tend to do this too. I, as I harvest, I put the names on them, especially if I haven't grown them before, so that I can recognize, you know, the varieties. I do have my plants labeled, but I pick them off and throw them in the basket as fast as possible. Notice the variety of colors and sizes and shapes on her tomatoes. That's what we're going to talk about. Next slide. Okay, so we want you to think about it um, before you choose your, your plants. So probably there are lots of fabulous plant sales in Sonoma County that are coming up just this in these next couple weeks. So you need to be prepared ahead of time and study those lists. Most of uh, the plant sales put them online so you can look at it look them over carefully because we tend to get carried away, don't we? When we go to those sales and we think, oh, that sounds great or somebody will talk you into another tomato. But you need to think about where you live and what's your microclimate and how long is your growing season. If you live near the coast or, you know, someplace where it's pretty cool, Boy, those great big tomatoes, the, the long season, late days to maturity, they're tough to grow. If it's really nice and hot, you can grow most things, but if you have a lot of wind, you know, you want to you wanna think about all of those things before you buy too many tomatoes. Um, and then what do you plan to do with your tomatoes? I love beautiful colors, but I'm also a big canner and I'm a master food preserver and I do can lots of my tomatoes, but I love to, they need to taste good <laughs> while I'm out picking them in the garden as well. So, um, but what I have found is that if you want to make sauce, here's sauce from paste tomatoes that are yellow and here's sauce from paste tomatoes that are red. So if you want a red sauce, you need to get red paste tomatoes. So if you just want to eat them or you want to slice them, then you're going to want to make sure that you have them throughout the season. So you want not all late season tomatoes. And then think about what kind of space you have. There's lots of fabulous different tomatoes that can be grown in containers. Lots of dwarf tomatoes um, from the Dwarf Tomato Project. Um, and, uh, oh, I see a question, yay, already. Um, so think about what, where, you, where you're going to grow your tomatoes. So don't go too crazy until if you don't have a lot of space. Next space, next slide, please. Okay. So you want some early, some mid-season, and some late-season tomatoes. The, how long it takes tomatoes to mature varies widely. So if you're a tomato snob like me and won't eat grocery store tomatoes, then it's been a long time since I've had a fresh tomato. So I want to make sure that I plant some early tomatoes so that I'll get them as quickly as possible, even though most of the early tomatoes are not my favorites, but I need to have a homegrown tomato. Uh, I definitely get slicers. Um, and if you're going to process your tomatoes, some paste varieties. Paste tomatoes are ones that you can be used for cooking down and make and canning um, paste or canning sauce. Um, we would suggest some hybrids, especially if you have problems with disease and blight. So um, 
Hybrids have been bred so that they're resistant to some diseases. There's always a trade-off, however. So, um, but if you have if you've had trouble with um, disease, pick a hybrid. So, fit make tomatoes that fit your space. You might want determinant or indeterminate or dwarf tomatoes. Okay, next slide. So I want you to look at the, again, the variations in color and in size. It is amazing, as you know, to have these tomatoes and then have a nice platter out that, you know, you have red and green and orange and yellow and mm, it is just each obviously tastes a little bit different and it's just pleasing to the eye and the palate. Next slide. So here's most tomatoes that you will buy are indeterminate tomatoes. Indeterminate tomatoes, they continue to grow and they produce fruit until they're killed by the frost. So they can get really big and they require staking or caging. And Kitty's gonna tell you all about those. Most of the tomatoes are indeterminate tomatoes. I only grow indeterminate tomatoes, but I have a lot of space also. Determinate tomatoes, they grow to a certain size and then they stop growing. The fruit ripens all at once over a short period of time and they grow shorter and bushier. And some people don't even cage them or stake them. They just let them go. Um, it's, you know, you can figure that's really great for somebody like a company who's making a bunch of ketchup or canned tomatoes because they go out and harvest and they take everything all at one time. We don't need that all at one time. It is more convenient if you're going to go through and make a lot of sauce. That a lot of the paste tomatoes, um, uh, some paste tomatoes are determinant, and then you can harvest the whole uh, the whole plant and then go ahead and make your sauce uh, or juice. Uh, dwarf tomatoes. Dwarf tomatoes are super fun. If you haven't ever grown a dwarf tomato, I highly recommend them. They have beautiful, most of them, those rugose sleeves that are thick and deep green and wrinkly, and they grow in a small space, and they're, they only grow two to four feet, and the, but the fruit is not dwarf. <laughs> the fruit can be any size. So what they've done is they've, they've bred open pollinated, you know, um, uh, big tomatoes with a dwarf tomato. So um, it's, they're really great. And there's a wide variety. They're beautiful in a half wine barrel. You can do them in a large pot um, and you still get lots of tomatoes off of them. Most of them are uh, 60 to 80 days to maturity. And um, so they get lots, lots of fruit. So, so think about that one. Next slide. Heirloom tomatoes. Heirloom tomatoes are my favorite. Um, and they're uh, open pollinated. All, um, so open pollinated. Um, they're, all tomatoes have perfect flowers. Okay, they have all the things that they need in that one flower in order to make another tomato just like it, just like themselves. Um, but there are certain instances where they can be pollinated by insects. So some, it's the way that the, the shape of the flower um, on some of the tomatoes is that allows it to be pollinated more easily. So if you're planning on saving seeds, you need to make sure that you put a distance of at least five to 10 feet between your tomato varieties if you really care about having a real true variety. Lots of people go through and just plant them. I do this and save seeds from the tomatoes that you love. And they may change a bit because they might have been pollinated by uh, another um, a bee that's, that's hit on another flower as well. Heirloom varieties, they have a history. So they're passed down from generation to generation and they're often carried by, by their immigrants from their homeland. So like Ukrainian heart is one that I'm sure that will be extremely popular this year that came from Ukraine. There are lots of Russian tomatoes. Russian tomatoes are some of my very favorites. Um, and they have a great story. Uh, next slide. 
hybrid tomatoes. So I bet you can guess what tomato this is. Most people grow this one, it's sun gold. It's the only hybrid that I grow. I like open pollinated heirlooms, but they're nothing, nothing, nothing beats a sun gold tomato. Um, hybrid tomatoes are crossbred from two or more plants and they've selected out different characteristics that they're breeding. So when the hybrid tomato seeds are planted, the resulting plants may not replicate the original. So you can't really save seeds from this. The seeds for these tomatoes are more expensive because it's a, it's a lot of work to go through and take those flowers and you know make sure they don't pollinate each other and crossbreed them. So um, it's, hybrids are great if you've had issues with disease. There are lots of them are disease resistant or if you really like sun golds. Okay, next slide. So days to maturity, really, really, really important. So that means that's the number of days it takes from when you put the plant into the ground. So, um, so you go through and if you, know, if you have something that's 100 days to maturity and you plant it uh, you know, the 1st of May, it's gonna be a long time before you see one tomato. So you, you want to balance those days to maturity out when you're choosing your tomatoes. So the things you want to think about is the seasonal weather and the microclimates that you have. So if you know you've always sort of had trouble growing tomatoes, don't get something that has, uh, you know, a, uh, lots of days to maturity. Try, try an earlier um, uh, tomato, uh, a cherry tomato that will keep producing for you. Um, and, you know, ju just think about where you're trying to grow this tomato. Okay, next slide. So early tomatoes are um, from 50 to 65 days to maturity. So there's a few of the choices. Uh, some of the um, plant sales will have them grouped by early season and they will let you know what the days to maturity are. But if you've got your own list already, things that you're really interested, you really love, look them up before you go and get them at, at your favorite plant sale and make sure that you know you sort of have a balance in there or add in one that you might be missing. The mid-season tomatoes are 70 to 80 days um, that, that it takes for them to, to produce. So some of these, mm, some of my absolute favorite are mid-season tomatoes. Paul Robeson, fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Print, uh, the Borghese's are wonderful. They're great for drying. Um, beautiful tomatoes. So late harvest tomatoes also. Boy, they are so good. And if you've got the right climate, you've got um, heat that, that will last for quite a while then go for some of these late harvest tomatoes. So Goldman's Italian American is one of my absolute favorites for um, canning. Cherokee purple, of course, everybody loves Cherokee purple. Um, okay, next slide, please. So what's a paste tomato? That was a question I saw already. I think somebody put it in the chat rather than in the Q&A. So please put your um, questions in the Q&A. So paste tomatoes, they have fewer seeds and thicker pulp. These are paste tomatoes getting ready to be processed. They are characterized by high amounts of sugars and acids, which make them much more flavorful. flavorful. And they have a lot of pectin and less water than other tomato types. So because they have all of those things put together, it makes it so that you don't have as, it doesn't take as long to cook them down. So like this, this jar of sauce, if you can see, I cooked it down for quite a while. I use just about anything, uh, whatever, <laughs> whatever's producing, I go through and put it in. But boy, if you use, if you're gonna can and use just the, the paste tomatoes, it's a lot easier, a lot less time. Next slide. So here's some different kind of paste tomatoes. Many paste tomatoes have this, you know, oblong pear shape. So um, Super Italian is, couldn't get the seeds for that one this year. 
um, San Marzano and Roma. I personally don't prefer the Roma, the taste of the Roma, and most of the San Marzanos, I like to just eat off the vine. So I have to have both things, but all of these are dense. You know, the skins come off super easy when they're um, smooth like this. Next slide. So here's my favorite. Not all of paste tomatoes are pear-shaped. So this is my favorite paste tomato and my friend Denise's too. She introduced this to me. Um, it's called Goldman, Goldman's Italian American. They're huge. It's an indeterminate plant. It does take 85 days to mature. And, but I tell you, they are wonderful. Very few seeds and pulp in there. I don't mind the seeds when I'm going through and, and canning, um, but it doesn't have a lot of the water in, inside it. So these also, you know, if you, um, a lot of people shy away from these if they're canners because they, they think that they're harder to, it's harder to remove the skins. It's not that hard. And these Goldman's are, are worth it. And there's several ways you can do that. And master food preservers will be telling you that as we get closer to real tomato season. Next slide. So I want you to think about how many is too many. Too many, this is too many. Last year I grew, I don't know, I think 39 plants of tomatoes and I didn't waste tomatoes. I made tons of sauce. I gave them to people um, and people are very happy to get your tomatoes. But think about a lot of them start coming all at the same time toward the end of the season, depending on what you're planting. So this is a lot of work. And we, you know, water is scarce. We want to make sure that we're using the water to grow things that we are really going to eat. So practice some restraint this year. I certainly am. I, I promise I am not planting that many tomatoes. Uh, next slide. So these are some things that you can do. Let's say you do end up with too many. So there's lots of different gleaning organizations in Sonoma County. There's three that you know, lots of people use. Um, you can, you know, if you just go and Google um, gleaning, gleaning groups in Sonoma County, you can come up with lots of others. You can also donate produce to the food bank near you. Um, I am, I volunteer at Harvest for the Hungry and we have Elijah's Pantry, which is right next door to us and we grow food for Elijah's Pantry. So if I have extra produce, I can bring it, I just bring it to Elijah's Pantry or I bring it to Harvest for the Hungry. So find out, you know, look around. Also, give your neighbors and friends tomatoes or you know, whatever you're growing because you wanna make sure everything is, is used well. Um, okay, next slide. All right, so now growing your tomatoes, one of the first things you need to think about is the supports um, after you get them in. So Kitty's gonna give us a really detailed look at tomato supports. All right, tomato supports. Oh, these are not lined up anymore, so we'll just live with it. So it's supposed to say cages on one side and steaks on the, the right side. And, and it, I, it did, it did. And I, I, I'm not sure why it's like that now, um, but, but we're gonna go with flow, so. We're not, we don't care. <laughs> so uh, cages, you have, um, for each plant, tomato plant, you need one cage. Why do cages? Well, there's no pruning needed. You put the cage on and the plant grows the way it wishes naturally. They keep the plants off the ground for healthier fruit. And um, back in the day, I was an organic farm worker and the farmer tried to grow his uh, tomatoes on the ground without any support and it was a real mess. So I don't recommend it. They're very e easy to use. And because you leave all of the foliage on the tomato plant, they can reduce sun scald. 
um, that foliage uh, covers up the actual tomatoes. Now let's go to the right side, sticks. So why have sticks? Well, if your growing situation um, inclines toward growing things in rows rather than in beds, stakes are best if you wish to prune. And pruning tomatoes is removing the suckers, which then can be propagated. So if you are uh, willing to prune and um, replant those suckers, uh, you can have quite um, an extensive crop. Uh, it does keep the plants off the ground and it does require weekly maintenance. Hear that? Maintenance, weekly. Okay, next slide. So this is a cage. This is a standard old hardware store cage that you would buy. It's a wire enclosure to support the plant. No pruning, it keeps the plant off the ground. It's easy to maintain and it can prevent sun scald. Next. Okay, when you select a cage, smaller determinant or container varieties. So you've heard what determinant is. If you are growing a determinant tomato, it's not gonna get that big. You can get by with one of those smaller hardware store cages. It could be four feet tall, but it needs to be 18 to 24 inches in diameter. Indeterminate varieties, which are most of the tomatoes that you will encounter, need big cages, like six foot cages with a 30 inch diameter. And the opening in the cages need to be six inches to allow harvest. So you saw the picture of Toby's uh, Texas um, tomato cages. Those are big enough to grow a really big tomato. When you're spacing cages, you need to have them two to three feet apart. So your little tiny tomato seedling is going to grow and it's going to grow outward as well as upward. If you put your cages too close together, you're not gonna have air circulation and then you're inviting diseases. And you can support your cages with two stakes if needed, especially with homemade cages, it's a good idea to have extra support. And stakes, usually you're looking at a four to six foot stake. It can be wood or it can be metal. Next. Next slide. All right, homemade cage. Now, if you are into using what you have around or what has been recycled, this is the cage for you. It's made out of wire fencing or sometimes called remesh if you're in the, the concrete department. You can get a 19 inch diameter cage at a six foot length of this wire. It comes in rolls or you may find it in, in lengths. Uh, you just make a cylinder and if you're me, you tie it with wire or twine. If you have a welder or someone who's really good with tools, you're gonna to attach it um, more permanently. And if you're using just wire fencing, you may need to cut holes big enough for you to harvest in the wire. So this is smaller gauge wire um, and I had to cut holes in it when you cut the opening, just beware that you make a nice clean cut so that you don't have sharp edges. Next. Now, this is my recommendation for the best buy. In recent years, I've been stocking up a few every year on heavy duty, easy to store, collapsible tomato cages. And I, 
just love the fact that I can collapse them. They flatten down and they are so much easier to store. So in a small lot like mine, they're gonna live right under the, those kayaks there and uh, be out of the way. Next. All right, staking, the other alternative. Now this is a serious tomato crop and they have, they're growing on a hillside. So staking for them was a better option. You're not gonna have this many tomatoes most likely, but if this is what your land looks like, you might wanna have stakes. You need a six foot stake and it's an inch and a half to two inches um, in uh, diameter. You can have wood stake or metal. Eventually you're gonna have to replace wood stakes uh, there's issues with pressurized wood and vegetable growing, so I don't recommend using pressurized wood sticks. You need to drive it a foot into the ground, and it's better to install it before or at planting four to six inches from the plant. So for you people who have planted tomatoes a lot before, you know that you can plant your tomato practically horizontal. It's um, helpful to have the stake already installed so you know where it's gonna come upward. When you put the stakes in, you attach the twine or cloth strips then every 10 inches. I think this is absolutely brilliant. I was always out there trying to do it as the tomatoes were growing. No, just put them on at the beginning. As the plant grows, you tie up the main stem and you prune the suckers. And uh, you'll see what, which one is the sucker soon. Next. So here is a pruned tomato on a trellis. And instead of having a stake, you use a trellis, you plant your tomato, you're going to attach it to the trellis in some way. And this is really helpful in a container. So Sue Lovelace pruned this tomato in an excellent way. You can see that the straight up and down stem of the tomato, which is really a vine, is going straight from bottom to top. Then you see that the branches that are coming off the tomato are horizontal. And what she's done is everywhere there's an intersection of the vertical and the horizontal, there was another little stem that wanted to grow at an angle between them and she took it out. That's the pruning. You also later in the season can prune foliage off or top your tomatoes, lots of different ways to prune tomatoes. And I'm sure we'll discuss that later in the season. Next, that's it. Thank you, Kitty. I'll, I'll never forget the, the <laughs> when I first joined Master Gardeners and moved up here and got to be able to grow tomatoes all the time. Um, I had a friend that was a Master Gardener come out and I was very proud of my tomatoes. And I said, well, what do you think? And she said, well, I, I think you need to get better tomato cages because these aren't going to make it. And she was absolutely right. It's, it's very disappointing to buy those little small ones that you get at the store that are inexpensive. Um, because one, if you have an indeterminate late season tomato, they just get huge and mine fell over and they kept growing, but it was sad. So be prepared. So now we have our master food preservers group and we are going to do cool weather pestos. So what a treat. And you know, if you um, have not ever had a cool season, cool weather pesto, you're, you, you will have to take some notes here or go back to this once we get on YouTube. Next slide. There we go. So Master Food Preservers, this is our mission. Um, it's to keep California safe as well as use culturally, culturally appropriate research-based practices to safely preserve food in the home, reducing food waste, increasing food security, and providing engaging ways for Californians 
to explore healthy food. So the first thing, and we may skip through this a tiny bit, is you, know, you need to make sure your work surfaces are clean and your tools are clean. And um, then your hands are washed, you've got your apron on, and then you can go ahead and start. Next slide. So here's some resources. And those will, you will, those will be available also from the QR code that we will give you at the end. And so now Sue Lovelace is gonna take it away and teach you how to make some cool seasoned pestos. So Sue, it's all yours. Hi everyone, it's pesto time. The purpose of the demo today is to bring awareness to food waste and those edible parts of fruits and vegetables that we normally discard. The pesto recipes that uh, I will show and talk about today highlight seasonal greens like carrot tops, fennel fronds, fava leaves, stems to spinach, parsley, and arugula that are sometimes cut off and thrown away. Did you know that pesto comes from the word pestar, which means to pound or crush? Well, that's what I've been doing in this mortar and pestle and what others have been doing through the ages. Uh, I have this book, Alice Waters, The Art of, of Simple Food, and I find it a great resource in that she said that you could use um, uh, young green leaves like arugula, and parsley and fava and uh, fennel uh, in your pestos. And, um, you know, when the warm season comes, then the basil uh, will come in great amounts. And that's the popular one. But I, I'd love for you all to try these cool weather pestos. This one is arugula pesto. I started by uh, uh, pounding, not really pounding, but crushing uh, garlic and salt. And then I added pine nuts, a quarter of a cup. I added um, a quarter of a cup of Parmesan and just kept mashing it all together. Once it was all kind of pasty, I put it in a bowl and I did the same to the arugula leaves. Now they're all back together again, and I'm going to add some olive oil gradually to this um, mortar. And um, you may wonder, well, I've got a food processor right next to me, and it's a great tool for pesto, but I have found that the taste of this mortar and pestle is just divine. So I'll probably use it for small batches when uh, whatever comes in from the garden. Um, of course, you wouldn't want to do it with tomato leaves or a lot of warm season leaves because they're toxic, but the cool weather leaves are all terrific for pesto. Okay, so I've added the olive oil and I'm just going to put it on this pasta and Later, we will have lunch. Now, doesn't that look great? Okay, so now I want to make some carrot top pesto with cashews. I toasted the cashews. It's a quarter of a cup. And then I'm going to add that in this food processor uh, with some garlic. And... Um, going to grind it up a little bit. Now this recipe and all the other uh, things I've talked about will be on our recipe page. Grind out the rabbit. And then I'm going to add uh, some carrot tops that I've cut in two inch pieces. Um, some parsley, about a quarter of a cup. There's a cup of carrot tops and a quarter of a cup of parsley. Oh, the parsley just love the rain. 
I guess everything did. And I'm happy that we're gonna get some more. I'm gonna put some salt and pepper in this too. And then I'm gonna make racket again. So well grind up. It's it's time for, I guess I'll add my Parmesan. Sometimes I don't add Parmesan until I serve the pasta, uh, but the recipe that I have for you on the recipe page calls for a quarter a cup of Parmesan. Okay, slowly I'm going to add the olive oil, olive oil which is, a, I believe, let me see what the recipe says on that. It's, oh, six tablespoons. And that also is on the recipe page. So I'm gonna add it slowly. Other ingredients. I like it to be a little rough. I like to see the greens in my, uh, whatever I'm using it for, uh, but you could keep grinding it until it's uh, like a paste. You see that there? Okay. That's our carrot top pesto. That's gonna go over some roasted carrots on Easter. So that's kind of fun. I wanted to say, uh, talk a little bit about containers uh, because uh, there are various containers that you could use for freezing this pesto. And if they're airtight, it'll keep up, a pesto will keep up uh, in the freezer for a year. Uh, the canning jar, uh, half pint is really good size with the screw on lid, but you can use the regular lids uh, to the canning jars. This is a bamboo container uh, with a plastic lid, but you can use plastic. Just make sure it says it's for the freezer because some plastic containers are not made for the freezer. This is one of my favorite. It is a glass, I use lots of glass, mainly glass, uh, because they last so long and wash up so nicely. And it has a snap-on lid that really is very airtight. And so uh, that works. And many people use these ice cube trays. Uh, it's covered, so you could put small amounts of pesto and um, then pop it up. The bottom has these little uh, rubbery, uh, uh, well, it's rubbery on the bottom and you can just pop out uh, little chunks of pesto when you need it. Pesto is good for sauces, soups, uh, pastas, pizza, uh, roasted vegetables, fresh vegetables. It's, uh, there's a myriad of uses. Uh, for pesto. And um, I would say to you that uh, if you haven't had pesto on pasta, uh, you haven't tasted anything really as good as that. Well, maybe you have. It's kind of a personal opinion. I'm going to go quickly over a veggie sauce that I kind of was inspired um, by, I was watching the Today Show and they had this uh, quick uh, green sauce. So uh, I could, this is kind of my little take. I've embellished it a little bit, but I add lemon zest, lemon juice of one lemon. Actually, I'm go going to use uh, a lemon and a half because I like lots of lemon. And then I'm going to put plenty of garlic, but you wouldn't have to use garlic if you're, you're not one who enjoys garlic, but we do. We, we like our, uh, our sauces uh, really garlicky. 
Then I'm just going to add some spinach with the uh, stems. Uh, great way to use the whole spinach. I'm going to plop it in there. It's just, uh, I don't even know. I, I'll call it one bunch, but it's really a handful. And it's something that uh, it, whatever you have, mint is good in this sauce. If you add mint to some spinach or chard, um, kale, any greens that you have out there, this is a great sauce. And then I'm going to add some, uh, a little bit of olive oil. If you're restricting your uh, oils, you could add uh, vegetable broth or water uh, to make it uh, the consistency that you want. And that's basically it. I'm searching for the lid, I'm not finding it. Here it is. Okay, I'm going to put the lid on and give it a whirl. This lid isn't working. Oh my gosh, it's probably right here in front of me and I'm not seeing it. At any rate, I would whirl this until it's the consistency that I like it. And then I usually have it over pasta. Um, you can add salt and pepper too. I notice I have some salt and pepper. I'm going to whirl this later, but it ends up being this intense green sauce. And I don't add the Parmesan or a lot of oil uh, to this recipe, but it doesn't need it. It uh, just uh, has this lemon, garlic, herby flavor. And uh, so anyway, I'm going to whirl that later once I find the lid that fits. And I will tell you, it's, it's really good, especially over pasta. And okay, so I'd like to encourage you all to use your greens and um, get out in that garden and see what's out there and try not to throw anything away <laughs> and uh, have a great Easter. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Sue, by the way, did, uh, okay, so it just had the greens in there and the garlic and a little um, uh, olive oil and that's all? The no, lemon, lemon zest. Lemon. Okay. Yeah, and that's because it adds, it's, well, in our taste, the lemon and the garlic, and I put X, you know, I put plenty of zest. I probably put a, a lemon and a half of zest and the lemon juice. That flavor with the greens is a bit different than say the, um, the pesto that I, the pestos I just talked about. And I will say that you'll see on our, our recipe page that fava bean pesto and fennel frond pesto both use lemons in their uh, pesto. And I think the reason is, is those leaves tend to be mild in flavor. And so lemon just enhances it. So, um, and the nice it. thing, you're using the zest from the lemons, so you're not wasting that. And I mean, it's a win-win, really. <laughs> That's awesome. It yeah. looks delicious. And um, I was telling you before, I had made the fennel frond um, pesto, and boy, I tell you, it was great. Really, really good, huh? Yeah. And then you're not, then you can eat the fennel as well or you put the fennel on top of the pesto. Um, but you know, the fronds I usually, I usually do just compost. So it's nice to be able to use all parts of it, so. It really is. And you know, I was going to say also, when you have the green sauce and say you have it on a pasta, then you, if you want Parmesan or pine, toasted pine nuts, or we use walnuts a lot, toasted walnuts, you could just spread it over, uh, you know, individual serving. So um, that's lots great. of options. Yeah. Awesome. 
And so we're going to have those recipes available for you on our website. So, but I have a QR code that's going to be coming up. So make sure that you have your phone available. Uh, otherwise, you can go to our website. This is a fabulous book, so easy to preserve. It only has tested recipes in it. It's, um, it's through the um, University of Georgia. And um, so I highly recommend that book. We have a great website and we have um, for Sonoma County and our own Kathleen Fitzgerald or does a Facebook page also that has fabulous recipes on them. Uh, next slide. So also, if you need help with food preservation, we just did an Ask a Master Food Preserver. It's an online Zoom where you can ask questions. Um, but you probably, as you're going through and thinking about canning ahead of time here, you might have questions. Or if you get into a project and you're not sure, we are available for you to answer questions uh, remotely. So you can go through and here is our uh, email address. We do have a phone. Now that'll, you will leave a message there. And then there's an online information request form. So we're here to help you um, preserve your food in a safe manner. All right, next slide. So here's some resources. Um, on YouTube, like I said, I would go back to YouTube and do April 2022 and listen to that. The whole thing is on tomatoes. The first piece is on choosing tomatoes. The second piece is on planting tomatoes. It's a really good one. 2021. Oh, I'm sorry. 2021. Thanks. Thanks, Ellie. This is 2022. Okay, um, and so we have Facebook. We have past information. Um, it's UCIPM. Uh, next slide. Okay, and there is a follow-up survey that you will be getting and it helps um, provide us with tools. We need to grow and improve the quality of our program. We hope you've enjoyed the program. We're gonna do some questions. Um, okay, so next slide. Let's get those QR codes out. So here's the first one and it's for master food preserver information. So those recipes that Sue was talking about, this is where you get them. There's lots of great information on the site too, and not just those recipes. So look around while you're there. Next slide. And this is information on our uh, seasonal gardening information for on the Master Gardener site. Excellent information. So here's a QR code for that one. Okay, and so now if you could, Stop the share and we'll do some questions. And I know that this question got taken off because probably it didn't go exactly with what we were doing. However, somebody asked if we were going to talk about planting tomatoes. Yes. So when you go and get go and get your tomato, good sized tomato, too big tomato. Look at how big that is. This is a green giant. And I have to say, I planted about one week early. And so these have gone crazy. I just ripped the leaf on this one. So there was a question on how to plant leggy tomatoes. You know, they are really pliable. You can go through and lay them down this way. And as you loosen that root ball, you put it on a ramp. You, uh, you put it on a ramp and you make sure that you bend it up this way and then you plant it in the ground. And I think that you've got that, that um, <laughs> uh, I think that question was answered for you, but this is not too, it's not too big. So you can always go through and plant it. So let's look at some of our other questions. Um, okay, let's see. So here is, um, okay, sorry. Uh, here's a question on for Jude. In snipping the wire mesh to harvest, what works well for me is to use the garden green tape to put at least two wraps over and to cut to cut and protect yourself in the harvest you pass through the opening. Okay, this was actually Kitty. So you were going to talk about that, Kitty. So go for it. I just think it's a great idea. It's a fabulous yeah. idea to wrap your openings so that you don't snag yourself. Yes. Good, 
good plan. Because it does hurt. I mean, I have many of those cages and you just have to, you know, make sure that um, you're really careful as you go through. Um, let's see. So then there was another question and this is probably for you too. I have done this. So you, but I'm going to ask you Kitty first, has anyone had um, success using the one string trellis system for tomatoes? And I think they're talking about the Carolina weave. So oh, the Florida weave. Florida weave, that's it. Okay, well, there's two different things that you can have. One is the Florida weave the, where the, the string is horizontal and it, you weave in between alternate plants. So, you know, kindergarten weaving over, under, over, under. Your plants are in a row. You go to the right of the first one, left of the second one, right of the next one, left. And you keep on doing that between your stakes as the tomatoes get taller. The other way to do a, a string trellis is to have the strings go vertically. And then you twine your tomato around the string as it gets taller. You can also just attach to the uh, string. I'm a lazy gardener. I use cages. I have seen beautiful food gardens that have used these two weaving systems, but you have to maintain them. The tomato's tendency to vine is not strong enough to tendril around the strings themselves. You're the one who's going to have to make them vine around uh, the central point. They won't do that naturally. They're not like a clematis or a sweet pea. So exactly. good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, look those up. There's it, lots it, of information about different ways to, and suggestions about different ways to um, do your, your weaving of tomatoes on string. And, and, and I, I, I'm with you, Kitty. I've done it before. I've, I did a whole row of tomatoes that way. Um, it's, I thought it was very labor intensive and, you know, you have to, you have to nip off, um, you know, just like she was telling you going through and do this cut out, get out rid of the suckers. Otherwise it just goes everywhere. It expands both directions. And to me, honestly, when you're cutting out those suckers, that's tomatoes that you're losing. I would rather just go through and space my tomatoes a little further apart. But if you want to try it, it's um, you have to you do have to be careful of sun scald. It's um, easier to scald your tomatoes because there's not as much foliage. So it's called the Florida weave. And, um, you know, there's lots of if you just Google it or put that into YouTube, you can get lots of uh, hits on that one. So, OK. So most of the links that we've given you are not Facebook. There was a comment that they wanted something that wasn't Facebook, I hear you. Um, most of the things are, are just websites that you're, you are going to go to. Lots more great information. YouTube also, Sonoma County Master Gardeners has our own YouTube um, page. So you can go in there and listen to all the veggie happenings that we've done so far. Or you can go and we've got much shorter videos. Um, and then let's see, um, Kitty, this is for you also. Um, mm -hmm. This person looked on Amazon and they said that the openings are 18 inches in diameter, not 30 inches. Were you talking about height or? Diameter. Diameter, okay. So yeah, 30 inches is, is pretty big. 30 inches is pretty big. Yeah. Um, Personally, so that information came straight from UC. Mm -hmm. um, I think that my, um, my tomato cages are about 24 inches mm -hmm. in diameter, the big folding ones that you can get. I have seen um, a lot more folding in answer to another question, where do you get them? I've seen a lot more folding cages in the last two years. They're pretty easy to get. Any really good um, hardware store, sometimes at nurseries, 
and um, feed stores. Feed stores are a great uh, resource. So uh, you should be able to find them. Yes, they're pricey. Um, you always have the homemade version if you want. Great. Yeah. And you know that um, the ones that I got that was in that first slide, I did order them online and it was <laughs> a lot of money. And, you know, I ordered, there were two sizes. There were, I forget what the diameters were, but there was like large and giant. And I got the giant ones and I should have just got the large, even for the green giants. I found that those are fine. And they also, the ones I bought, they break into three pieces um, and two pieces you get with when you buy them. But the other one was an additional piece, probably didn't really need that one either because when they get that big, it's later in the season and those are usually those big heirlooms and so they don't have enough time to mature anyway. So, um, okay, sucker on a tomato plant. What's a sucker on a tomato plant? On this wonderful little uh, Bertoli paste tomato, um, as you put it in the ground, you can go through, first of all, you bury it as deep as you can. If you have something big like this, you know, yeah, I, I would strip all the leaves. I would lay, this one you're gonna have to lay sideways unless you wanna dig down two feet. But um, you plant it really deep. And what happens is then it starts growing out from here. So between those Vs, there's another stem that's going to come out through there. And it will be fruitful, it will produce tomatoes. But um, when you're going through and trellising, you don't want the, the different branches to go out at, at odd directions. So those you're gonna go through and pinch off. Also, I think, you know, it's a lot more work too. Uh, and you don't have to pinch them off uh, if you just put them in a tomato cage. So um, the cages are round, the ones that, that collapse are round. Kitty, have you seen them, any of them that are square? I have I, like I have recently seen a lot of advertisements for square and actually in person mm -hmm. have seen square tomato towers they usually call them. Okay. Uh, some of them are collapsible and uh, I don't see why the tomato would care whether it was square or round. Mm -hmm. So it's really up to you what works for your space. And um, just remember, leave enough room between cages for air circulation. Perfect. And then also, you know, I do have some of those that are four sides square, but they're not quite as big for a tomato. They, they're more, they're different, like some of mine are red and some are green. I use them for peppers, things that, you know, are about that, that size. Um, and then I want you, you know, just remember if you're real picky and you want to keep the, the um, tomato variety true, that you want to space between the tomatoes like five feet or more between different varieties. Um, okay, I think that we have, let's see, uh, somebody asked their brand name for the collapsible tomato cages. Um, no we're can not, do. We're master yeah, gardeners. Yeah, we, we're not supposed to do that. So, um, okay. How many tomato plants for a four by eight box ideally? So um, I, I squish three in, but, you know, I'm not too worried about the cross pollination in there. So, um, you know, you can, I, I also interplant. So a lot of times I'll do two, one on each end and then put other things in between. It's a nice, cool space sometimes, depending on how you're, you situate your beds. It get, gives, provides shade. So you might be able to grow something that doesn't like quite as much heat there. Okay, so let's see. And I think that's it. So I hope you've enjoyed our, our veggie happenings this month and enjoy those tomato sales. We do have a list on the uh, Sonoma County Master Gardener webpage of all the fabulous tomato sales that are happening in the next couple weeks. So please support your community and go out to one of those. Thank you very much.